Welcome, uh, Dr. Huma Farid and Raime J. Perlman uh, for joining me. You know, I, I've been thinking recently how important it is in our different roles um, in this community that we'll talk about how uh, we have a responsibility to support our students at a particularly challenging time um, in our world. Um, and I want us to get into that and talk about it a little bit because of uh, the work that, that, that you do or will be doing. Um, but first of all, I, I really appreciate both of you being here, and I thought we could share um, how you both became involved in the Needham Clergy Association and, and what that's all about. Maybe, uh, Rabbi Perlman, I'll start with you. What is the Needham Clergy Association, and how did you get involved in it? So the Needham Clergy Association is a leadership group of the various faith communities of those living in and actually around Needham. And essentially, the, the clergy, for the most part, we come together to really talk about um, the spiritual health of the town and how it is that we can work in service and in partnership with the leaders of the community in order to ensure as healthy a community as we can possibly have. And how long have you been involved? So in I've been involved for 21 years. So um, there's been a long standing tradition member. of I am an older member. Of the, thank you, Phil. <laughs> elder. Elder, elder statesman. I, elder heard, statesman. I heard older. Oh, elder. Elder. <laughs> elder statesman. That's OK. Um, so there's been a long standing tradition of the rabbi, at, um, of one of the rabbis, or all the rabbis, actually, at Temple Beth Shalom, mm -hmm. serving as part of the New York Clergy Association. Rabbi Rifat Sensino, when he retired in 2003, um, I was invited to join. And Rabbi Todd Markley and Cantor yeah. DJ14 were all part of the Clergy Association. And, and Dr. Fareed, how, uh, how did you become affiliated with the Needham Clergy Association? I'm not clergy. Okay. <laughs> so I feel a little bit like an imposter, but I um, became involved actually through a WhatsApp group where one of the members um, is involved in the Needham Diversity Initiative and spoke about there being a need for a Muslim representative on the clergy council, and they asked for volunteers. And so I volunteered. Uh, and I've always really had an interest in religion and spirituality and in interfaith relations. And so this is, it felt like a wonderful opportunity to get involved. Yeah. Well, that's great. And I appreciate your, your, your work within the community and, and a whole lot ahead for, for you. You know, I want to bring us back several weeks ago. Um, we were probably all in different places on October 7th when we heard about the terrorist attacks um, against Israel. And I'm wondering, can you share with me, you know, where were you and, and what went through your mind? Um, what did you tell your family? Um, what, what, what did that look like for you, Rabbi Perlman? Um, so for me, I found it, I, I saw it early in the morning on, um, on social media and um, on the news. So I followed the Israeli media and the American media. And um, in those first hours was really following, really, the terrorist attacks as they were unfolding. Um, it was it was deeply emotional. Um, it was deeply personal. Um, I have family in Israel. Um, certainly, we, we had spoken as a family about what had happened, um, but um, it was it was catastrophic. It was really really catastrophic. And we were at that time because it was a Jewish holiday. We were stepping into services that morning, as well as a learning group that morning, and so. Um, we very much needed to have conversations about what was happening and about our shared concern about what was happening in real time. Dr. Fareed, what about you? Where, 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 do you remember what, that morning where, where you were? And, and I'm so sorry to hear that that was your experience. And, you know, for us, I have to confess that we were actually hiking in Vermont where, as a family, and so we didn't have access to internet or the news. And so I don't think we realized what had happened until we actually came home and just on social media, I think either Facebook or Instagram, realizing that there was something that was happening um, and just not understanding the true enormity of it until later that evening. Yeah, yeah. And, and what about your families and your children? What, what have you, did you reach out to your, 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 your children and, and what have you subsequently told your children and how, what, is that, what, what does that look like? So, you know, my kids are little. I have a six-year-old and a nine-year-old. I think my six-year-old has no idea what's happening. Uh, but my nine-year-old, I think, had heard a little bit about it in school, though elementary school, I think they really do try to protect the kids, but just wanted to know, I think, you know, why people hurt each other. And I don't have a good response for that. It makes me feel very inadequate as like a parent and as a human being to say, I don't know. And to not, just, just to struggle with how to present the fact that yes, bad things happen, but we can be better about not letting that 
impact us in the sense of retaining our faith in, in humanity and retaining our faith in the goodness of people and acknowledging that, yes, this horrible thing has happened, but we can work together and build trust and move forward. And I think that this is such a difficult concept to explain to a child that, you know, this horrible thing has happened. It doesn't mean that horrible things will continue to happen, but that we need to be, we need to look at the other side and be more thoughtful and, and be kinder and more respectful to each other. Yeah. How about your family? Yeah. I'll say amen. Um, um, the needs of our family changed over, changed over time. And certainly, um, I think that in the, at the epicenter of the, of the attack, um, our family was, we certainly had conversations. Our kids are older. Mm -hmm. So my daughter just graduated college. My son, um, our son just, just started college. So we had more conversations during the day about what was happening and we were watching this really unfold. And so our response at the time was less about a why and more about a, um, like, how are we, how are we navigating this? How are we, how are we feeling about, about this? Because we were watching a catastrophe mm -hmm. unfold. And again, as I, sh as I shared a moment ago, I mean, this, this was personal. Like our family has lived in Israel for a period of time. And so people were just, our, our kids especially, they were, they were worried about what was going on. So we just kept the lines of communication open um, as that began to unfold. And then certainly over the past 50 plus days, mm -hmm. we've been continuing to have conversations about, and certainly our kids' needs have changed over time because of who they are, how old they are, and what they've been exposed to. You have the additional responsibility of uh, taking care of your congregation and ministering to their needs. What, what has that experience been like, uh, particularly as you think about some of the younger uh, uh, families and, and, and children who, who have kids in school? And yeah, I mean, I'm blessed to be part of an amazing team of professionals and lay leaders in our community. Um, and everybody with whom I share partnership, professional partnership, understood and continue to understand the enormity of, of what took place and what continues to, what continues to take place. And so with our, with our kids, specifically within the, within the community, we really spoke about um, what are their needs how do we help to inform and empower parents to be, to be the healthy parents that they aspire to be? How can they work at home? And so we shared a lot of information about um, how best to parent, suggestions for parenting and conversations depending on the age and the developmental stage of, of our kids in terms of who they are and where they are. We talked about how to bring this up and to navigate this within the context of the community as people are coming together, whether it's for classes or for worship. And what we came to understand over time really was that um, as our kids, but adults as well, and when I talk about our kids, I'm also talking about our college kids as well, mm -hmm. is, um, is that each of us, each of them and each of us, we, have, we, had, we had needs of the heart we had needs of the hand people wanted to do and to, to be responsive and to be helpful. And people have needs of the mind to try to eventually try to understand like what is happening, what, why is this happening and how can I come to understand sort of like what's going on so that people can live in relationship to what's going on in a way that, that feels authentic to them. In your role as a physician, as a mother and as, as a leader in, in the Muslim community, what, what what was going on in the community? What, what did you hear and, and how, how did you provide what support you could uh, for, for folks in need of them? I think the community was extremely distressed by the October 7th attacks. And obviously, you know, I think the hard part is that any time there is a terrorist attack, the Muslim community members are asked, well, do you condemn the attack? And of course, I mean, like, yes, we condemn the attack, right? That should never even be a question. Uh, and the challenge is distancing ourselves from terrorists and saying, this is not what Islam is. This is not who we are. We are your neighbors. We are your coworkers. We are your friends. Um, and of course, you know, we do not support what happened on October 7th and we condemn it. And I think the community feels very sad that this question arises anytime attacks like this happen. You know, I was a teenager when 9-11 happened and, you know, I was born in New York City, grew up in New Jersey, my parents worked in New York, and so it was very uh, troubling to 
live through that and, and just, you know, our school was 45 minutes from New York and to have people ask, like, well, are you a terrorist? You know, like, how could this happen? And it felt a little <clears throat> bit like we were being asked to, to portray ourselves as, you know, or to defend ourselves against this accusation yet again. Uh, so, of course, people felt horribly about what happened on October 7th. They felt as well that their patriotism was being questioned and judged, similar to how it was during 9-11. And then they also, you know, as subsequent events unfolded and as attacks began in Gaza, there was this deep concern that about the loss of life on both in both Israel and in Gaza. And I think that continues to persist, this concern and this feeling of helplessness, like we cannot do anything, it's so far away. And the narrative around the humanitarian crisis in Gaza has unfortunately been tainted by politics. And I'll give you an example of that at work as well, where, you know, I'm a physician, we all took a Hippocratic <coughs> Oath to serve humanity and to really ensure that our actions do no harm. And the CEO of our hospital network sent out an email two days after the October 7th attack, sort of grieving and, and processing. He is Jewish and lived in Israel for 20 years and wrote that in his email. Uh, and of course, you know, I could feel <coughs> how upsetting this was for him through his words. And yet he neglected to mention the events unfolding in Gaza. So I reflected for a long time about this because I know that, you know, he had family there. He was clearly, and I don't know him personally, I just, but through his email, just, I could tell that he was, he was grieving. And so I thought about the next steps that I as an individual can take. And of course, he doesn't know me. I'm like one of a thousand doctors, but he has no idea who I am. But I decided to write back to him a couple of days after his initial email because things, the humanitarian crisis in Gaza was really unfolding and it was very concerning that hospitals were being targeted, that you know innocent civilians were being killed. Uh, and he hadn't mentioned that. And so I, I wrote to him and I said, you know, I understand that you're really grieving and I'm so sorry for what you and the community have gone through. But I also think as physicians, our obligation is to point out that there is now this humanitarian crisis that's unfolding that we need to think about um, and that we need to address. <clears throat> to his credit, he never responded to me, but he sent out another email specifically addressing our role as physicians in settings like this, that our role is to provide support and help. Well, it's a, it's a, a um, segue really to my next question is, in our roles, certainly in my role as a school leader, I, I know I have struggled to find the right words or, or um, find the proper way to support our families, our Muslim and our Jewish families at this time. It, it's been a challenge, and certainly for our teachers as well, particularly teachers of older students who are asking a lot of questions <laughs> about what is happening and why. Um, can we, perhaps could you both share with me, what, what are some things we can talk to our young people about at a time like this, uh, when there is tension, both either in the community or in the internationally? What do we tell our young people? What are the, what are the words that, that, that we use? So first of all, I just want, I want to lift up um, my appreciation for the way that you handled the dissonance that you experienced sort of professionally. That in, in many ways, I think it speaks um, to the question that you're asking, which is to say that, that you experienced dissonance and disappointment in an encounter that took place. You didn't assume the worst, although it could have been the worst, but you didn't assume the worst. And you reached out graciously to ask a question and to lift up a perspective that might not otherwise have been, have been seen. And I think that if I were to sort of reflect back on how we can most responsibly encounter each other and help our kids to encounter each other and encounter the, the grown-ups, the adults in their, in their lives, is to do so with grace and with humility. Mm -hmm. And to start from a position of, of asking questions, from a position of inquiry, and from a position mm -hmm. of listening. And so for them to be able to ask what is happening, and when they experience something that is causing them confusion or consternation or anger or pain, to then be able to, to try to find an answer and to try to find a trusted expert, a trusted adult, whether it is, it could be a teacher, it could be a pastor, it could be a rabbi, it could be an imam, and to be able to have that conversation about like what is going on and how do I navigate what is happening because what's happening right now is happening on so many different levels yes there is the political issue and if and if it were just the political mm -hmm. issue if it were just the political like we say in, in hebrew say dayenu like enough 
right? Like we're not going to solve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in a short conversation or a meme or a Snapchat or any of those things. But we do throw, do so through conversation. But the other layers of this is that there's, there are emotional needs, there are familial needs in terms of like what, how I'm experiencing this because I have friends who are in Israel. There are so many um, different, um, as I was saying, different needs that people have. Mm. So how do we engage in conversation with people and help our kids to engage in conversations where they're, where they're asking and they're listening and they're learning and growing and they're understanding to whom they can go to find answers and then to form new questions. You know, to be curious and not to condemn, I right. think is, is what you're, you know, you both through when you talk to the CEO and you're sharing right now. What could you advise me as the superintendent of the Needham Public Schools, 5,500 students, um, as, as we're trying to support our, our families and we're trying to support Jewish students and Muslim students and their families, what, what is some advice that you would you'd give me? Um, I was in high school a very long time ago, so I feel like I'm not well equipped. But I, I do think that, you know, what I remember at our very first meeting, you said something about like leading with love, and I think that's just so important. And I think about that a lot, actually, um, because I think emphasizing the bonds of our shared humanity is truly the only way forward because we're all grieving in different ways. And unfortunately, in the recent years, particularly with social media, American politics, like life in general, has become very polarized. And it's very easy to hate someone who you don't know because you've never talked to them. It's much, and it's very easy to do that on social media, much harder to hate somebody when you've engaged with them, when you've had lunch or coffee or sat with them and had a conversation that is based on curiosity, inquiry, and advocacy rather than on saying, I'm right, and of course I'm the only one who's right. And I think we need to move away from thinking that we know all the answers and saying, I'd love to hear your perspective and your thoughts. And I, and I think about this a lot. You know, I don't teach young students, but I teach adult learners in my work, and I can only understand my own perspective. I never know what's going through their minds unless I ask. But if I ask, it has to be from a place of psychological safety, where they mm -hmm. have to know that they can trust me, that I won't judge them, that I won't mm. make them feel badly about whatever their questions and thoughts are. I, I think what you're both saying is so powerful, to engage one another, to connect on a human level, uh, and to be curious about how they're feeling and what they're thinking. And, and um, that, I think, at the end of the day is going to help all of us and our young people better understand the world and one another and, and get to that place of love that, that you talk about. Um, you know, as we wrap up this conversation, I'm, I'm wondering if, if both in Islam and in Judaism, if there is a, a saying or something that comes to mind, or maybe it's a short prayer or something that kind of captures this moment of, of love and connection and curiosity, um, is there something like that, that that you could offer up? Well, I don't think necessarily a prayer, but I think just the way the entire religion is framed. So when you meet another Muslim, you say, assalamu alaikum, and that means, you know, peace be upon you. And their response is, peace be upon you too. And that really emphasizes the religion's message of peace, peaceful living, peace within your soul. That has unfortunately been truly distilled and distorted in the last 20 plus years. And so that's what I think about that, you know, when my children greet their grandparents, or when they greet other members of the community, they're wishing peace upon them. And that's what I truly hope we're able to achieve. Rabbi Perlman. Yeah, so <clears throat> um, there's, a, there's a beautiful Jewish teaching that comes out of the, the initial chapters, the initial verses, actually, of the, the book of Genesis that teaches in the, in the legend of creation that when God created the world, God created human beings. In Hebrew, it's B'Tselem Elohim, which means in the image of God. And that has been interpreted over time as meaning to, that when one sees another human being, that one is, is called upon to, to acknowledge the sacredness of the soul of every person that we encounter. It doesn't mean that we agree with everything that they, that they say. It doesn't mean that there aren't issues that are challenging, but it means that we honor them. We honor them as human beings, leading to the beautiful peace that, that you spoke to. And on the one hand, one could say that that's, that's an incredibly simple notion. But on the other hand, one could ask, but what if people actually live that yes. way? Yeah. What if when we did encounter another person, 
we actually did see the sacred mm -hmm. in them. And that's not to, to make an overly religious statement. It's to say that, that there is something um, extraordinarily, infinitely precious about every single person. And unique and, and, and important. And, yeah. You know. And what that does is that that's not just a statement about what one acknowledges, but that becomes a commanding voice. That to say that if I see the sacred in another person, then I'm called upon to encounter them with dignity mm -hmm. and with honor. And one of the major crises of this time is that people are looking in the eyes of others and they're disregarding that. Mm -hmm. If we can lift up that honor, if we can encounter that person with the humanity that they have been endowed with, then indeed we can bring ourselves to a place of encounter, questioning, curiosity, and ultimately discovery, building, and peace. Mm -hmm. Share that Hebrew expression again. B'Tselem Elohim. And share the greeting again. Assalamu alaikum. Rabbi Perlman, Dr. Farid, I very much appreciate not only your time, but also the support you're providing your neighbors, family members, and most importantly, assisting me and all of our families and teachers in supporting our young people. Because um, it's a critical time for them, and having this conversation is, is one step in, in um, how we can work together to help, engage, help them engage with one another, connect with one another, and, and, and be curious about the world around them. Thank you very much. Our joy. Thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm.